hello and welcome to your damn jets today uh, what I want to do is to continue my series on the PCNS lymphoma uh, today I'm going to talk about my attack uh, of lymphoma that's how I call it I don't know if there's a better term for it nobody has ever corrected me and said no it's not an attack but uh, that's what it felt like to me um, before I get to the attack proper I think it would be good to give a little bit of context um, as to uh, my own situation uh, while I was having my problems with the lymphoma. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm not working and I've stopped working just about when the visual symptoms started and the symptoms have nothing to do with, with me stopping working. I had a client in California and they decided to go into a different direction entirely. Um, I don't know how well that's working for them, but uh, as part of that, they decided to just stop uh, development of, of uh, the project that I was on. Uh, and I'm a software engineer, so I was doing software engineering for them, writing software. Um, and when they decided to not continue with me, I decided, oh, this would be the best time to do the master bathroom remodel. So I didn't look for another job right away. I concentrated on a remodel. I, I had started before that, but it was part time, and now I could do it full time. So uh, that's one thing. And networking is a great boon because of all the appointments I have with the doctors and my chemo required admission. Which for some people it doesn't require admission. They can pretty much do chemo at home. But my chemo required admission every time. Um, also, the other thing that I want you to be aware of is that I do have a comorbidity. Uh, I have heart disease. I had a heart attack at age 24. And it was not caused by any bad lifestyle. I was... First of all, I was unlucky because... Other people in my family had the same have the same problem, and they haven't had a heart attack. But also, um, yeah, I have familial hypercholesterolemia. So, on my father's side of the family, most people uh, have that problem. And the heart disease, unfortunately, uh, is going to complicate a lot the diagnosis of of my case. Uh, and it's going to cause me some mental anguish also. Uh, so now that you know that, we can go on to the event of uh, the attack. Uh, on June 5th, 2020, I was on the way back from checking the garage door. I think I was closing it or checking that it was closed. I was walking in the kitchen and all of a sudden, the entire right side of my body shut down. It stopped working. My arm was not moving anymore. I could not raise it or move it up and down. My leg was not working anymore. I had to seek a chair right away to avoid falling on the floor. The right side of my face was not working anymore. Um, to everybody involved, me, my wife, uh, the, the emergency text that came to check me, to everyone it looked like it was a stroke. And, you know, I just told you that I had heart disease. So um, there was a, a good likelihood that this was a stroke. Uh, but the emergency technicians uh, made me pass all the stroke tests and I passed them with flying colors. You know, all this stuff like put your hands like this and close your eyes. And I did all of that and there was they couldn't find any problem. So... And they gave me a choice. They said, well, we can take you to the hospital. You can stay home. We, we do not see anything that requires intervention right away. Uh, and I guess they were right because it was a lymphoma. Um, and I decided to stay home. But later in the day, around supper time, um, I decided that uh, I should go to the hospital. And the reason that I did that is because... I didn't feel well and on top of that there was this weird feeling over all my body of a kind of a slight pressure 
and it's the kind of stuff that is very annoying to try to describe and very annoying to to handle even like should I go to the ER or shouldn't uh, but at that time I decided that I should just go to the ER and and have them examine me um, so I went to the ER they did tests on me um, and that was June 5th 2020 they did uh, I think they might have done CAT scans and some preliminary stuff to make sure that I was not bleeding into my brain. Um, they, they uh, after, and I was there from June 5th to June 9th. So they, what they did over that time also is a spinal tap. That was the first of three spinal taps that I got. Um, and this one went pretty well. Uh, it was guided with the, uh, Fluoroscope, I think they call it. I don't remember, but they can see where the needle is going. Um, they did an MRI. Uh, they did other tests. There were blood tests, more blood tests. So I said that the ophthalmologist that saw me for my visual problems, he gave me like I had a, probably some sort of a, I don't remember. It's a, a sexually transmitted disease syphilis I think it tested me for syphilis I think I was tested again for syphilis I was tested for Lyme disease I think that was again some of those tests were repeats um, uh, so on June 6th I had the uh, first neurologist come into my room and start talking about strokes which for me made sense. I didn't want to have a stroke, but it made sense that, that it would be talking about that because of my heart history. And later in the days, another neurologist came in and he's, he, he kind of set that aside and he said, you probably have MS. Um, and the probably there is, for me, doesn't mean much because from that point forward, they they acted towards me as if I had MS. So they treated me for MS. They were planning to give me drugs that are for MS people. I was treated as someone who has MS from that point forward. So to me, that the probably is not particularly meaningful. Uh, also, that on uh, June 6th, I started experiencing uh, simple partial seizures. Uh, which I think is no longer the correct term, but that's a term that I learned. Um, and I call them, uh, well, they're, I don't remember how it goes, but basically, uh, when I have the seizures, I stay awake. I don't lose consciousness or don't know what's going on. I stay fully awake. Um, and it's just the, the right part of my body that is affected. And what happens is that my muscles are contracting so at that time it was fairly intense so my leg would kind of bend by itself my arm would raise in the air by itself i might make a a sign with like <laughs> uh you know devil uh or anything I, mean, I could clench my fist or whatever um i guess it really depended on how the muscles were which muscles were affected in the hand and probably the right side of my face that, you know, I didn't look at myself in the mirror, but it was probably affected too. So I started experiencing uh, simple partial seizures. Um, they gave me Tegretol uh, for that, which is also called carbamazepine at first to treat the seizures. And it did work, but it hammered my white blood cell count. And now I... In retrospect, a lot of stuff, you know, I'm rethinking in retrospect. I don't know. At that time, we thought, well, it's a reaction to the Tegretol. But now I'm wondering whether it was my lymphoma acting up. Because the lymphoma works on the immune system of your body. And the white blood cells are the immune system. So could have been the lymphoma doing things to me. Uh, so I took Tegretol at first and it helped. Eventually, we discontinued it because my white blood cell count was low. Um, uh, the MRI they did at that time showed lesions in the brainstem, which were interpreted 
by the radiologist as uh, again possible. I think I think the word is there possible demyelination, but for me possible it's like if you're treating me as an MS patient then you you know I ha you're telling me I have MS. Um, and that's what happens when for people who have multiple sclerosis, MS is multiple sclerosis. What happens is that they have demyelination. Um, so the myelin sheet over the neuron uh, gets destroyed. Uh, and I'm not a specialist in that, so I'm not going to go much further. Um, so yeah, uh, I was hospitalized June 5th. Well, June 5th, I was at the ER. June 6th to June 9th, I was hospitalized. And then from that point on, there was a series of ER visits because I was not feeling well. Um, so on June 30th, uh, I went back to the ER and I just felt generally weak. Uh, and that ha that's a symptom that happened over time uh, while, the while we didn't know what was going on with me. That I was just some, some days I was feeling very weak, some other days I was better. Um, but on June 30th, I was weak enough that I thought, well, I should see them to see if there's something they can do. And they basically didn't do anything. Um, on July 6th, I had my first meeting with a neurologist at the hospital I had assigned to me. Um, one of the things... <laughs> One of the things I did was to look him up online between the time I was admitted to the hospital and one month later with my appointment with him. Because I was at the hospital on June 5th and one month later on July 6th I meet him. So I had time to look at him up. And a lot of stuff that was coming out from his uh, reviews were God complex. And I agree with that. <laughs> um, and you're going to see that... It, it, <laughs> It's not going to be uh, a walk in the park for me, and it's not going to be nice for him. Um, eventually, I fired him. Uh, but so I meet with him. He says I probably have MS, and again, probably doesn't mean anything to me because they're they're treating me as somebody who has MS. There's no there's no range in MS. Either you have MS or you don't have it. And if you have it, they're going to treat you in a certain way. And if you don't have it, then they're going to treat you differently. There's no range of, well, MS, probable MS, and not MS. And um, So one of the things he said, I, I had emails, communication with him uh, during that time. And one of the things he said, which was pretty bizarre, so I said God complex, you know, <coughs> Excuse me. The Chagrital for my seizures was three times a day, and then I do write to him and I say, you know, this is happening, blah blah blah. And then he replies. He says, "Oh, I told you three times a day. It's not three times a day. It should be two times a day." I don't know why I said three times a day. So you already that's a bad sign when a doctor tells you. I don't know why I said that. Um, the other thing is that. Uh, on July 6th, and I knew, I saw the reports before seeing him, but on July 6th, one of the things that for me was problematic is that I had no oligoclonal bands in my spinal fluid. And uh, the oligoclonal bands do not have to be present for an MS diagnosis. But it, uh, when they're absent, it's, it's, it's in a rarer number of cases. So usually if somebody has MS, they're going to have oligoclonal bands in their spinal fluid. However, it is possible to not have them and still have MS. And the fact that I didn't have them for me was not like, oh, I don't have MS, but it was like, why don't I have them? You know, uh, I, I thought that was bizarre. Um, the other thing is that he told me he got the second opinion by asking the radiologist to confirm his diagnosis which i thought was ridiculous you don't ask the same a second opinion is not asking the same person the same question and the second opinion that has to be gotten from a different person so to me that that meant nothing um 
Unfortunately, again, in retrospect, now I'm thinking the steroids I had already gotten before I got the MRI because of my eye problems might have affected the MRI in such a way that they couldn't, you know, there was something there, but they couldn't really identify it. Because I, I, I remind you that the steroids do dampen the activity of the tumor. Um, so yeah, in the initial meeting with my uh, neurologist was, to, for me, left me uh, dubious that, yeah, this is MS. He was, he was treating me as an MS patient, but I, I, it was dubious for me. Then in July, after that meeting, and maybe even before the meeting, I don't remember, I started have, developing gastric symptoms. And again, retrospectively, I'm thinking those gastric symptoms were caused by my lymphoma and nothing else. Uh, it was just gut churning. It, was, it wasn't, I was not having indigestions. I was not in terrible pain. It was just very uncomfortable and my gut was churning. That's the best way I can put it. Uh, so I went to the ER um, on July 18th for gastric symptoms and they said, well, we, they didn't really know what was going on and they said, if it's, it comes back, come back if it worsens. On July 20th, I went back to the ER for more gastric symptoms. And I think at that time they said, well, you should say gastroenterologist and they're gonna figure it out. And again, ER, the diagnosis that you get from them are <laughs> kind of ridiculous. I don't know how what they put down as a diagnosis in their sheet for the gut problems. Um, so I had gut problems, and those gut problems went on for a while, and eventually they disappeared. I don't know why. That's why I'm thinking is a lymphoma, because lymphoma was in my brainstem, and the brainstem regulates the base functions of the body, and the gastric uh, functions are basic so that's why I'm thinking the lymphoma made a mess uh, there um, on July 22nd I met my neurologist for the second time uh, and at that meeting um, I asked him to give me a reference for for a second opinion I had already contacted Johns Hopkins to try to get a second opinion but they told me uh, they have they have requirements, um, and I guess especially for MS patients, they have more requirements than maybe other branches because what they don't want is, is like the person the hypochondriac just coming in and saying, "Oh, I think I have MS. What tests have you done? You know, what evidence do you have that you have MS?" We're very busy. We're a big institution. We don't want to have people just walking off the street and coming to bother our doctors so they have a they have a system in place to make sure that the people who get referred there uh, need to be seen and among the requirements is that somebody on your existing team needs to refer you to them it's not a, requir a requirement of my insurance it's not a requirement uh, in general it's just Johns Hopkins wants that so I said um, I want a second opinion and his first reaction was you don't need a second opinion I you know I've given you my opinion what what possible purpose could there be for a second opinion um, so at first it didn't want to but his tune changed very quickly he said oh you want a second opinion okay I'm, I'm going to arrange it at first it was no and then he flipped and I think the problem there is that maybe he was spinning a little bit in his mind and he realized I, I'm, I am absolutely certain that if a doctor refuses to give the patient the tools for a second opinion, in this case a reference, I needed a reference from him for, to get a second opinion, if the doctor refuses to give the tools to the patient and things go bad, there can be a problem for the doctor. So the safe things for the safe thing for him, even if he thinks the second opinion is not necessary, is to just give it to me. And really, if you if you do the the, 
if you walk through scenarios, you really realize that that's the best thing for him to do or any doctor to do. If they, if you want a second opinion, you just you give your patient the tools to go get the second opinion. If the second opinion is the same as the first opinion, then you you can gloat that you were right in the first place. If it is different, then maybe someone else just save your patient's life. Um, and and this is important because if the if your patient dies and they can trace back the problem to your misdiagnosis, you can be in trouble. But if someone else saves the patient while well, you didn't die, uh, it's a bit it's a bit sad, but that's the way that's the way it works. You know, oh you have no lasting damage. Well then you know the doctor is misdiagnose you, but we cannot really do anything about it because you're still alive <laughs> and you're you know you're not maimed you're not you don't have any kind of ongoing problem um so i got my second i got the reference for the second opinion on july 22nd um and at that point, because of his first refusal and then his agreement and his demeanor and everything, I, my confidence in that doctor was going down the drain. Um, so on June 20, uh, no, not June, July 24th, I was to the ER for anxiety. And I will tell you that if I have a health problem, if I have a health problem and I have a plan to attack it and deal with it, usually I do pretty well. But if I have a health problem and I feel that the doctors uh, don't really know what's wrong with me, excuse me, don't really know what's wrong with me, then uh, I generate anxiety fairly easily. And at that time, I went to the ER for anxiety. I had a high level of anxiety. Um, I don't remember what they did at that time. I don't think I got... I might have gotten Xanax at that time uh, to help deal with the... But I, I'm not sure. I don't think the first time I got Xanax. I Then on July 26th, I went... Uh, the spasms that I had were coming back. So. I had been on a Tegretol for a while and we stopped it because it was lowering my white blood count. Um, but eventually on July 26, the spasms came back and then I was put on gabapentin to treat the spasms. And the gabapentin then eventually did the same thing as the Tegretol. My white blood count was hammered. Uh, but by that time we had... I, I eventually stopped it, but we had moved on. Uh, so we didn't pursue that, you know, investigate that more. Um, on July 28th and 29th, I was at the cardiologist and I got the Holter monitor to check my heart because that's one of the problems and, and, and that's why the diagnosis was so complicated is I have heart disease also and we were thinking about strokes and one of the ways you can have a stroke is if you, you have arrhythmia in your heart. And sometimes people don't feel it. So you can spend all your life not feeling anything wrong with your heart, but your heart has arrhythmia and sends little clots to your brain and your brain dies. So we were checking that out with the holder, make sure that I didn't have arrhythmia. So it was a 24 hour monitoring and it found nothing. Um, then on July 31st, I was at the ER for a Lexapro reaction. So they were starting to give me medicine to try to control the anxiety and the maybe depression. And I had a reaction to the Lexapro. Again, I'm not sure that it's the Lexapro that caused a problem. It could have been uh, the lymphoma because I almost fainted when I took Lexapro. But, and it's one of the possible side effects, but I don't know if it was that or it was just a lymphoma missing with me. So... Not sure. On August 2nd, I went back to the ER for panic attacks and chest pains. I think that's when they started giving me Xanax um, to deal with the panic attacks. Um, 
And through, throughout the, the time, the period of time, I had all kinds of problems. I had, well, there was the fatigue that I mentioned already. I also had um, uh, the gut churning that was happening, and we didn't know what it was. Uh, also, the, I had cardiac symptoms. I had palpitations. Uh, I had high blood pressure. And... I complain about the high blood pressure and the, the cardiologist's the cardiologist's office was telling me, you know, I the high blood pressure is caused by the steroids. But I had stopped the steroids a month before. It should not be causing problems f for that long, in my opinion. And in the opinion of other people. I mean I've talked to other people online and I've done my research and I don't think uh, steroids are supposed to cause high blood pressure for that long a time. That was a cardiologist's office, which, by the way, is no longer my cardiologist. Um, and that was one of the reasons. I think the nurse who answered me there just wanted to get rid of me, and she said, oh, well, it must be the steroids. It's not the steroids. I had high blood pressure, and I got the cardio mobile uh, device at that time to check my heart rhythm, arrhythmia, and I had a high uh, blood pressure monitor to check my blood pressure. So I was able every day to check my rhythm and blood pressure. And I found palpitations with the Cardio Mobile. It's not it's not made to find palpitations, but you can see them <laughs> when you have when you when your heart skips a beat. You can see it on the trace. And I've shown it to my cardiologist. I said, "Yes, that's a palpitation." So you can you can find palpitations with it, but it's it's not marketed as such. Uh, so yeah I had all kinds of symptoms uh, troubling me at that time and in retrospect a lot of those symptoms like the gut churning the weakness the palpitations even the high blood pressure I'm chalking that up all that up now to the lymphoma because one of the things that came out of the whole uh process is that right now I'm not on any blood pressure medicine. I used to be. Before the lymphoma episode, I used to be on blood pressure medicine. At some point, the doctors decided to just take it off and see how I would react um, because they thought my my heartbeat was too, uh, too low because of the blood pressure medicine. Uh, they were not happy about that. So, But now I, I don't need it. Um, I go and my blood pressure is fine and I uh, you know, maybe at some point I did need it because of, I don't know how the body works, so maybe I didn't need it at some point. But the high blood pressure that I experienced that summer, summer of 2020, I, in my mind, it was caused by the lymphoma. Because before then, I never had high blood pressure. And also, there were spikes at that time that were dangerous. My blood pressure was very elevated for a few times that I, that I when I measured it very elevated elevated to the point where they say it's a crisis and you should go to the er and i told that to the cardiologist's office and it's like, oh it must be a steroid no um i'm thinking now it's all it's all the lymphoma um and you're going to see in future episodes why some of that is the gut churning is going to come back later and i'm going to tell you you know what we did for that um, so, okay, uh, th th that was the attack. The attack was on June 5th, 2020, and then that summer, from June 5th to August, um, I kept visiting the ER, and, and they were, you know, I was an MS patient as far as they were concerned. Um, and that was all at the local hospital here. Uh, Johns Hopkins, I was starting to talk to Johns Hopkins, but they didn't come into the picture later. So the lessons learned. If somebody gives you a diagnosis and anything is off in the diagnosis, seems off to you. The doctor has a God complex. The doctor doesn't seem to listen to you. The doctor, there's no oligoclonal band. Why? Um... If anything seems off to you when you get the diagnosis, get a second opinion. And if the doctor doesn't want to allow it 
by themselves, try to find another doctor or another way to get a second opinion. And ultimately, you may need to tell the doctor that if he doesn't play ball, is going he may find himself at the end, uh, he may find himself at the end of a lawsuit. <laughs> Uh, because that's how bad it is if you know if, if a doctor doesn't want to play ball with getting the second opinion uh, in my mind it's a lawsuit that you know I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at legal options um, mental health another, another lesson is mental health is hard to get in the US and I think it's probably true in other places too but in the US it's very hard to get it took me a while, so I had to go to the R for anxiety twice before he started giving me uh, the Xanax. Um, and part of this problem is that some people do have problems with addiction, and I think some doctors have internalized that they have they have some patients who have problems with addiction, and because some patients have problems with addiction, then they decide that they're not going to give Xanax to anyone. And I did feel that pressure when I was in the system that Xanax is the enemy. And if you go online and you search for Xanax, you're going to find a lot of places that tell you how to get off Xanax. And there and there are going to be places that are completely you know, batshit crazy, in my opinion, that will tell you that Xanax is the devil's drug. I don't believe that for one second. I had Xanax twice in my life. I had Xanax when I had my heart attack, after my heart attack. Uh, between the time that I had the heart attack and the time that the doctors, you know, were able to examine my heart and do a catheterization and go look at the arteries and tell me, you know, what happened. I didn't know what was going on then, and I was young. I was 24. So I needed the Xanax to calm me down. And I was I took Xanax at that time. Every time I, I felt a panic at that come, and eventually I tapered it off and I stopped taking it. And it's not a, I'm I'm not addicted to Xanax. I've never touched it after the heart attack. Then when I had the lymphoma, eventually they gave me Xanax again, and it's the same thing. I took the Xanax for a while because I had panic attacks. Then they put me on buspirone, and the buspirone is a um, an anti-anxiety medicine. So it was uh, good enough, you know. It was able to to manage the anxiety. And when I was on the buspirone, I stopped taking taking the Xanax, and I probably still have some Xanax somewhere in the house, you know, in case. But I don't take it. I'm not addicted to it. I don't go to the doctor and say, "Give me more Xanax." So Xanax is not the enemy. I mean, it can be the enemy if if you know you're already you have you have a problem with addiction. It could, it can be your enemy. But in, Xanax is not in general the enemy of people who have anxiety. They should if you have anxiety, you should try it. And if you find that it doesn't work, then try something else because there are other things than, than Xanax. But mental health is I, I think in the U.S. is hard to get. And it is important when you're ill to consider the mental um, impact it has on you and how you can take medicine uh, to try to um, improve the situation. Uh, you know, um, depression, for instance, I, I and I did have some bouts of depression but it's possible the buspirone took care of that. But I did have some bouts of the depression. And when you have depression because of a health condition, probably there can be things on the market that can help you. And now, I took the Xanax, I took the buspirone. Today, I don't, I'm don't. i not taking any of those things. I, decided, I told my psychiatrist, I said... I'm going to go off the bus Piron because I think that I'm okay now because I have a plan of attack and it's going well and I don't need to have those medicines to help me through the day and I stopped and I'm fine now so those are my lessons learned 
Um, the next episode is going to deal with hospitalizations because after all those visits to the ER, I still needed to be hospitalized uh, later to figure out what was going on with me. Um, and I may produce some parallel videos about things that are not part of like the narrative or would be difficult to put into a narrative. So for instance, I did a lot of home renovation while I had the lymphoma. <laughs> um, and it's interesting what I did, but it's not, I don't think incorporating it in the main narrative would, would work very well. Um, and also what I did to protect myself from COVID-19, I think would make for a nice uh, separate parallel video uh, rather than be part of the central narrative. So I'm going to uh, work on that and on other videos. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we've been at it for more than half an hour. <laughs> uh, um, I wish you good health. <laughs> if you have good health, if you have bad health, uh, get, good, get good doctors. And I'll talk to you next time.